Brisbane and South East Queensland has flooded again and the effects are also being felt in New South Wales, down to Lismore and Sydney after a rain bomb lingered over Brisbane, delivering almost a year's worth of rain in three days. The city was underwater, boats and pontoons were washed down the mighty Brisbane River, roads became kayak courses and parks became raging torrents. Not to mention the countless number of homes and businesses that were inundated, causing extensive damage. So how can we stop this? How can the residents and business owners of Brisbane and other flood affected communities avoid this in the future. Will more dams help? What about the new Bradfield scheme? Let's look into this a little bit more because today we're talking tactics. Brisbane is no stranger to flooding. The city itself is built on a floodplain with a massive river that snakes its way through the city, the main culprit. There have been a few floods through Brisbane's history. The first notable one was the Great Flood of 1893. After a tropical cyclone, the river broke its banks and was recorded at 8.35 metres above low tide level, which is the second highest ever recorded. It's also known as Black February as the flood was responsible for the deaths of 11 people and the hospitalisation of 190 more. It washed away the original Victoria Bridge at the top of Queen Street and the railway bridge at Indrapilly and caused an estimated $4 million worth of damage, which was an absolute fortune in 1893. The next notable floods were the 1974 floods, resulting from a very wet spring that filled the river system to maximum, which was then pushed over the edge by Cyclone Wanda. The city saw the river peak at 6.6 .6 metres, which caused around 8,500 homes to be flooded and the formation of a 200 square kilometre inland sea. Sadly, 14 people lost their lives in this disaster. As a result of the estimated $200 million worth of damage, the Wyvernhoe Dam was constructed to help control water levels so that the city would never go through this kind of devastation again. But 2011 brought the rains again, and while the Brisbane River levels peaked lower than 1974 at just 4.46 metres, it was just as devastating. A strong La Nina weather pattern in December 2010 brought record rainfalls in over 100 locations in the state, which continued into 2011 and saturated the catchment system that fed into the Brisbane River. This peak saw 20,000 homes affected, a lot of Queensland declared a disaster zone, 35 people lost their lives and an estimated $1 billion worth of damage. So yes, Brisbane floods. But as we saw after the 1974 floods, mitigation measures were implemented to reduce the effects. Wyvernhoe Dam was planned in the early 1970s after the area was investigated for a potential dam site in the 1890s and again in 1933. If only they had implemented it sooner. It was designed as a response to the 1974 floods as a mitigation measure, but also functions as a water supply for Brisbane and Ipswich, hydroelectricity, and for recreation. At least they learnt their lesson and actually did something about it, even if it did take 80 years. During a flood, the dam is designed to hold back 1.45 million megalitres of additional water for flood mitigation or 225% capacity. Under its water release plan, excess water must be released from the dam within seven days of its reaching 100% capacity. On the 24th of February, 2022, Wyvernhoe Dam was only at 58% capacity, but by the 27th of February, after the intense rainfall, it jumped to 183% of its capacity. So is building more dams an option? Let's take a look at the two primary functions of Wyvernhoe Dam. The first is flood mitigation. As Wyvernhoe acts as flood mitigation, a water manager would want it to be as empty as possible so that when a flood comes through, it can catch and hold as much of the water to stop it flowing downstream. But it also acts as water supply for Brisbane and Ipswich. So for that reason, you would want plenty of water stored in the dam, not leaving too much room to capture floodwaters. Willem Vervoot, an associate professor in hydrology and catchment management at the University of Sydney, following the 2011 floods, said that reassessing development regulations in flood prone areas, such as limiting development on floodplains so that rivers can run freely through, could be a solution to mitigate flood damage. He also said potentially rerouting floodwaters to certain areas of the floodplain could be an option. So is this something that we can do? Australia is the driest inhabited continent on earth. We have extended periods of drought and then incredibly wet flooding rains. Are we able to harness the water during times of rain and direct it out to drier parts of the country? Well, there is a plan called the New Bradfield Scheme that is aimed at doing just that. The New Bradfield Scheme is a massive engineering proposal to divert flood water from the tropical north to the driest interior. The idea originally came from John Bradfield, the engineer behind the Sydney Harbour Bridge and plan to pipe water from far north Queensland to supply dams in drought-stricken parts of the state. The vision would see a series of dams 
pipes and pumps divert flood water through inland Queensland and to New South Wales and to South Australia, ending up in water storages, including Lake Eyre. This idea has been talked about by politicians for years. Last year, the Queensland Labor government established an independent panel in to investigate the viability of the scheme, but it has been delayed due to COVID travel restrictions. The Queensland LNP has also pledged $20 million to revive the scheme if elected. This water diversion could also be used as more hydroelectricity production, maintaining Queensland's status as a green energy superpower and supporting the green hydrogen industry. Already announced is a massive green hydrogen equipment manufacturing facility at Gladstone by Fortescue Future Industries. Twiggy Forest from Fortescue has already pledged to produce 15 million tonnes of green hydrogen by 2030. And if that is combined with the incredible potential of hydroelectric energy from redirected floodwaters, would Queensland have any equal when it comes to green, clean, renewable energy? Queensland is an energy superpower with our strong reserves of coal and gas. But we all know that the world is evolving and that's not gonna be around forever. We need to start thinking ahead and we need to start thinking big. What better way to transition our economy than by building Australia's largest dam network throughout the state? The proposal has enough renewable hydropower for 800,000 homes and a watered storage capacity the size of 28 Sydney harbours. Talk about securing our water and clean energy future. A project could be developed similar to Snowy Hydro 2.0 scheme. Snowy Hydro already produces hydroelectricity from the Snowy River in New South Wales, and the 2.0 scheme is the next step up from that. The project will involve linking two existing dams through kilometres of underground tunnels and building a new underground power station. When there is a surplus of energy production and demand for energy is low, water will be pumped from the lower dam back up to the higher one. That water will then be released back down to the lower dam to generate electricity when the demand is high. It will effectively store energy in the higher dam and then provide flexible on-demand energy while reusing or recycling the water in a closed loop. It can also maximize efficiency by utilizing excess solar and wind energy to pump water up to the higher dam. We've all heard the criticisms of solar and wind energy. The sun's not always shining and the wind isn't always blowing. This is an effective measure to mitigate that and store that energy essentially like a massive battery. This is a fantastic way to aid in our transition off coal and gas. If a system like this could be created that catches flood water in Queensland, then recycles it via a similar looped system amongst pre-existing or newly created dams, then a lot of damaging water could be stopped from flowing downstream and devastating the east coast of Australia once again. Not to mention aiding our transition to renewable and reliable power supply, while also turbocharging our agricultural industry and creating a food bowl for Australia and the world. Water is our most precious resource. We are the driest continent on earth. Massive investments in water is money well spent. We need to harness this gift of mother nature and use it to our advantage, whilst also mitigating the harmful effects of floods. This needs to be pitched to the people of Queensland as a major asset development strategy. How often do we see politicians pitching no asset sales? Well, guess what? I don't see any out there pitching that they are creating new assets either. Assets that will generate dividends for the people. We need big audacious projects that are going to be there for future generations of Queenslanders. The Australian people are strong, resilient, and will always help each other out through tough times. We've seen it before and we're seeing it now. My heart goes out to the families of those who have lost loved ones in this flood, who have lost their homes and their businesses. It's a truly horrible situation that absolutely no one should have to go through. So what do you think? Is it a viable option to divert floodwaters from coastal areas to inland Australia? Or is that a project that just sounds too unrealistic, massive and cost prohibitive? Are building more dams a possibility? Or should we just continue to do nothing? I'd love to know what you think in the comments section down below. I'm Mel Picos, and we've been talking tactics. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that video, please hit the like button. And if you're new here, why don't you hit subscribe? It's free and you won't miss out on the next video that we upload. See you next time.